Waters, and I'm the, uh, the new station captain at Lumina Sheriff Station, and I want to thank you for having us, uh, us arriving tonight and being here with us. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a uh, few people, if they're in the room, I don't see him yet, but my, uh, my division chief is uh, Steve Gross, and he he's, should be in the room somewhere, and my commanders, James Wallach and Chris Blasnick, are also here. Um, I'd like to uh, also welcome and thank uh, city managers uh, Ryan Smoot from Lameda, uh, Gabriella Yap from Rancho Palos Verdes and in lieu of the city manager, and uh, Yolanda Schwartz, and she's here from Rolling Hills, and uh, Erica Velasquez, um, the field deputy from Supervisor Hahn's office. A little bit about me, uh, since I am the new captain here. Um, I've been on the department about 30 and a half years, and um, I've worked a variety of assignments uh, in, in my career in custody and patrol, and a lot of my patrol experience deals with community policing and problem solving and relationships with the community, which is uh, a component of what we're doing tonight. And so um, I, I want to assure you, and I, I, I don't want to be long-winded, but um, I teach community policing. I have, been for, I have taught that for several years up and down the state of California, and I've taken it across the country and other states as well. And your quality of life and the quality of life of this community is, is my utmost priority. And so in order to manage that, uh, we, will, we implement community policing uh, concepts, problem-solving concepts, and partnerships in the community. And trust is the underlying uh, common denominator of all that. And so I want to make sure and ensure you that uh, that's where I come from. And I, and I have a, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about that. Uh, with that being said, I want to um, just discuss, uh, jump right into it, and just to let you know that um, I, I reviewed our crime rate. Uh, and so far this year, our crime is down 25% uh, overall part one crimes. Our, our violent crimes are down a little over 9%, and our property crimes are down a, a little over 26%. Um, and there are some specific areas where those numbers do increase, but these are overall general numbers. Um, and, and probably the biggest hot topic is burglaries, and, and those are down 25% overall, and uh, we're putting forth efforts to, to maintain that. Uh, a little bit of an overview of Lameda Station, if, if some of you are not aware of um, uh, I, I did some research, and, and what I've learned is that Lameda Station is referred to as the, the jewel of the South Bay. Uh, our personnel serve um, an unincorporated area uh, under Janice Hahn's office at District 4 of about 2,700 people. Uh, contract cities of Lameda, where we're at, uh, 21,000 uh, residents. Rancho Palos Verdes, about 43,000. Rolling Hills, about 1,760. And Rolling Hills Estates, a little over 8,200. Uh, we cover approximately 23 and a half square miles and a total of, of about approximately 75,000 residents. And the sheriff's contract within all of these jurisdictions is approximately $13 million a year. Uh, Lameda Station staff consists of a little over 108, about 108 employees uh, that we handle uh, all the station functions as well as, well as providing services throughout the community. Uh, we engage and partner with the community through our, our core team or our county resource team, our station volunteers, uh, volunteer clergy programs, explorer programs, our detective bureau, our burglary suppression team, crime analysts, and of course our professional staff that do all the work behind the scenes. Uh, we have surveillance technology that's been implemented to identify uh, uh, information to solve criminal behavior, and, and I, I, I state that as in a, a very general sense intentionally. Uh, we partner with all of our cities with neighborhood watch programs, and we rely on you, the community, uh, as a partner uh, to participate in these efforts. And so I'm proud to represent the station uh, personnel, and I thank you very much for the partnership with you, that we share. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to show you a, a video. Um, it's about three minutes long that articulates um, where the Sheriff's Department is and where we're headed. And then once we're done with that, I will invite uh, Mayor Henry Sanchez from Lameda to come up and introduce our Sheriff. Thank you.
If I may, I would like to just add one, one additional thing. Uh, I wanted to introduce uh, and acknowledge my command staff, Lieutenant Michael, Michael White and Sergeant Roger Digalanda, who uh, have kind of guided me throughout the, the, the week and a half that I've been here. And Lieutenant Mike has been your acting captain at Lumina Station for the last six and a half, seven months. And so I just want to acknowledge that. And so if I would, uh, Mayor Henry Sanchez is going to come up and he's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Now, this is more of a town hall meeting. You know that. Um, this is not a formal type of a meeting, so, but we will have the Pledge of Allegiance and we'll honor our country and our flag. We got a great country and we got some great people living here, just like you folks here. And so put your hand over your heart and follow me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, you may be seated. Thank you. Uh, just uh, so you know, I'm the mayor of Lamita. This is my turn to be mayor. And uh, I want you to know that I worked alongside of a lot of these deputies for a lot of years. I, I am a retired LA County fire captain. Uh, I was a paramedic right here in the city of Lamita for two years. And I've always respected these men and the job they have to do because I've seen firsthand some of the difficulties they've faced and had to handle when it comes to the public. And the public can get pretty bad sometimes. And uh, these guys have kept their head together. Uh, they've treated the people with respect and dignity. Uh, something I always required of my own men is that we always treated people, no matter what it was, from a nosebleed to a stomachache, we always treated everyone with respect and dignity, and these men do the same thing. I've watched them do it. So with that, um, I want to introduce some of my council members that are here, here with us tonight. Cindy Sagawa, could you please stand? <laughs> Mike Savadan. <laughs> who, like me, also worked for LA County Fire, uh, Cal LA County Sheriff's Department as a captain. And we also have Mayor Pro Tem, Jim Gaisley. <laughs> anyway, well, uh, with uh, no further ado, I'd like to introduce our new sheriff, um, Sheriff Villanueva. Uh, good evening, everyone. I want to thank you all for, for coming here and to sharing in this town hall. And uh, let me say some opening remarks, and then I'm going to actually yield the floor to our moderator, who would be Elizabeth Espinosa, my executive director of communications, formerly of KTLA, Fox 11, and a host of other things as a news anchor. And uh, so we managed to convince her to, to change careers. And um, But the video you saw was actually the past as you can see, it was progressing up to the present. Some of you recognize some of the, a lot of the historical uh, characters in that. We were the Wild West, and now we're modern Los Angeles County. But we're the largest county in the nation, the most populous, the most diverse, the most of everything. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, but it's, if it's big, it's here in LA County. Texas, they can claim their biggest everything, but actually we, we have a lot of big things here. And, uh, but part of the, the challenges of of being sheriff and running the sheriff's department is it is so big and the needs are so many in so many communities. Every station is unique. There's 23 stations and then the, the assembly of uh, your contract cities, unincorporated communities is, is different everywhere. And uh, so we have to honor that. So my whole uh, goal is to be, to meet every single uh, city, to come to every single station area host these town halls, be able to interact with you on a regular basis. And I'm a horrible politician, so I just say what I believe in. And uh, one thing I noticed in the past was that if I just show up during campaign time, what are you going to believe? That I'm only here for election purposes only. And I made my way around the county as much as I could during the campaign. And I wasn't going to wait four years to show up again. So I figured as soon as I, I hit the ground on December 3rd, we're going to hit the ground running. 
And first we started by, we had to fix the department internally. We had to convince people that we're a fair employer. We hire from our local community. We're not hiring out of state anymore because we want to hire your sons and daughters to become the deputies to serve your communities. That's our number one goal. So that way, over the long term, our department becomes a reflection of you, of the community. So this is your sheriff's department. And each of you has a stake in it. You're shareholders in this big uh, department. We're, by default, we're the largest sheriff's department in the nation, probably the world. And uh, we do a lot of things on a scale that most people can't wrap their minds around. But we've been doing it for so long, we just kind of just keep rolling with it. And every challenge is a new challenge. And going back in history, 1871, we had the Chinese Massacre. If you're unfamiliar with that, and who stopped it was the sheriff of L.A. County. Convinced people to lay down their, their firearms and their torches and, and let people be. And we've had these challenges throughout the years. We had uh, the zoot suit, things back in the 1940s. Uh, Charles Manson, if you saw in the video, when he was arrested, that was our department. And the Night Stalker actually was arrested by our department. And uh, up to the present day, the Nipsey Hussle murderer was arrested by our department. So we, uh, we don't have a big PR department. We just get the job done and we just keep moving on because our job is to serve your needs. And uh, we take constructive criticism, sometimes not too well in the past. And uh, that was a source of a lot of a conflict, a lot of tension, but we learn as we move on and we're, we're trying to get better at it. We're definitely not a perfect organization. We got a lot of room to grow, but what things that happened in the past or past practices, we're trying to end those. The fact that you have Jim Powers as your new station captain, up until I came into office, he pretty much didn't have a prayer in hell to become a station captain. Is that right, Jim? But he won the job fair and square, interviewing with the finalists, 10 finalists, who were among the cream of the crop of all the lieutenants on the entire sheriff's department. That's the start of the process where your local community, actually ad hoc committee that represented all the cities served by Lomita Station were involved in that, did the interviews of all the candidates. Your, uh, all the deputies that work at your station now, they have to serve a minimum of four years in that first assignment at the local station. Not anywhere else, not, oh, one year here and they're going to jump somewhere else and they've gone to somewhere else. No. you got to do your minimum time on the line as a deputy is four years. You can then, once you do the four-year mark, you can remain, which, of course, is great, or you can move on to become a detective, become a watch deputy, go on to a special assignments, our special enforcement bureau, the countywide de detective division. We have a lot of different assignments and a lot of opportunities out there. But if you become a sergeant, you got to go back to the line. You got to serve two years as a sergeant. You got to do the same thing as a lieutenant. The whole point is that we exist to serve the community. That is our number one goal. I had a former sheriff tell me when I was a young sergeant years ago that I needed to get out of patrol as soon as I could. And I always thought that was a, the oddest, uh, you know, recommendation or encouragement. It came from the sheriff himself. I thought, we are supposed to be in the community. And if my organization does not value my service to the community, what on earth are we doing? So our whole model now is built around serving the community. Everything we do is about serving you. And uh, we're going to rely on you. We need you to tell us, one, how we're doing, steer us in the right direction, provide the tips and lead, participate in Neighborhood Watch. Because being a U.S. citizen is, uh, is not an easy task. There's a lot of things happening. And you can't be disengaged from your own community. So you got to get involved. And we need you to be involved working with us. And that way, we're that much better, everybody working together, all working in the same direction towards the same goals and make everybody safe. And you're safe in your homes, you're safe in school, safe at work, your places of worship, places where you play, and everywhere in between. And we're going to be there with you through thick and thin. So with that being said, I want to turn it over to Elizabeth. We have the questions we gathered from everyone. She'll read through them. We'll, we'll get every question. If it's redundant, we'll acknowledge that we have multiple questions on the same one. Let me sit here if you don't mind. Okay. Oh, I thought there was a space there. Oh, do I have a... 
Do you have a micro? Do we have a microphone uh, handheld for the sheriff? Uh, possibly electronics. Who's our tech support here? Thank you. Do we have uh, another microphone? We don't. We're gonna go work on that. Okay, that's fine. It's just like the gold job, breaking news, developing as we go, technical issues, right? So great to see you guys tonight. Good night, good evening, I should say. Thank you for coming out. Um, I do want to set some ground rules because there's some faces that are familiar to me. Good to see you. Um, but this is a town hall. So by virtue of that town hall, what I'm saying is that this is about this community and your needs, and we want to hear from you specifically. There are other folks that I do recognize uh, that come from other areas, and they have been following us. We have like a little, you know, uh, great following, um, but it can get a little bit crazy, as the mayor alluded to earlier. And, and I think the last time we did have this, so you know, some people got a little bit out of line and were using foul language. And, and not that like, ooh, I've never heard a bad word because you know I was a news reporter. I've heard it all. Trust me, I've been yelled at quite a bit. Um, but we have folks here that, you know, let's out of just respect and, and you know, decorum, because I think that's what this country is based upon. You know, I have a show at KFI AM 640, so I, I, can, get, I can get crazy on you, but that's the voice you're recognizing. Um, Sunday mornings, and I'm not plugging my show, Sheriff, uh, shamefully here, kind of, but... Uh, <laughs> But I am mentioning that because it's what I tell my listeners all the time is it's a respectful exchange of ideas. And that's what this democracy is based upon. We have to get there. This is why Congress isn't getting anywhere. And I am very passionate about certain things. But I tell people we have to have dialogue. And that means I listen to you respectfully and you listen to me respectfully. And so those are the ground rules I just wanted to start off with. Um, also, um, I will do my very best. These are notes that are not typed. So it's handwritten. Sometimes I'm like, oh, no. So I will just say, call out your name um, and help me with you know, getting through it if I can't read this right or so. And I also will be inviting up our new captain, Captain Powers, because some of these questions really uh, pertain more so to this area, specifically to traffic. And the sheriff is dealing with the, you know, the entire organization. So he doesn't have maybe those particulars, specific. So Captain, just to give you a heads up, I might be calling you up here. So let's get started. Too bad we don't get music for this. Oh, well, so be it. Cindy, per is that Cindy Perkel? Perky. Thank you, Cindy. All right, Cindy's question, which I think is for you, Captain Powers. You're already going to come up here for a second. Uh, parking, right, at 240 Walnut, 240th Street, is that true? Uh, street is blocked by too many work ca trucks, cars. Oh, my God, I have that same issue, too. Can't seem to make a left or right turns. What are we doing about it, right? There you go. Sure. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is if you have vehicles that are parked illegally in your, in your neighborhood, call the station and report it, and that way we can get a prompt response. And that would be the first thing. As far as, far as uh, what we're doing about it, we can go out and we can, we can make contact with people. Uh, there's, there's laws that allow us to do certain things, where, whether it be a, a warning, a citation, or actually removing a vehicle if, there's a, if, the, if the vehicle could allows us to do so. So that's, that would be my response to that question. Great. One more. Done. <laughs> so Lori Ellsworth. Lori. Hi, Lori. Uh, curbs southbound, right? Painted red at 240th and Walnut, so turns onto Walnut can be safer. Is that right? As, as far as a, a red curb painting, that's something that I don't have the authority to, to uh, install or remove. And so that would be the city's um, concern as far as whether or not that, the, you know, they, they will look at it. And they have um, specialists that work in that field that evaluate the need or the or the the necessity for something like that. So my suggestion would be to contact the city. Oh, follow up. Go ahead. Um, when you come down on uh, 240th Street and you go, and then there's Walnut. There's the mobile home park uh, right there at the corner. There's two houses on the corner, and what happens is when you try to make a left or a right, because there's so many cars and trucks that are from the mobile home park. You can't see, so you're edging out and you're edging out and you're edging out. And there's been some pretty close calls. So that's why she mentioned that maybe painting the curb red or even having a sign that says, um, I don't know exactly how it says, but vehicles over a certain limit, height limit, to park further down. <coughs> and I, I, I hear it loud and clear. That's something that the, the city would have to implement as far as uh, in their zoning and planning, and, and there's there's some protocol that go along with that, uh, and they would have to go out and evaluate that 
And, and so that's something that you need to contact the city for. Great. Oh, we have a microphone. Perfect. So, Mayor, I'm sorry, where are you? Where'd you go, Mayor? Oh, hello, you're right in my face. Wow, I need my reading glasses. I know, you're not kidding. Boy, Sheriff. I need my eye exam. Uh, so maybe something that you guys can talk about. Um, you know, the mayor's here tonight. It's, it's tough because it's like a lot of these issues. We're going to get questions tonight. I'll, I'll let you know now about immigration, federal immigration, ICE, and our jails. That's Congress. So just letting you know now. That's Congress. The sheriff does public safety. I wish we could change laws here, but, you know, we have to comply with the law because if not, all of my colleagues, that some of them will be here tonight from the news world, will be all over him to say, wait a second, you're supposed to enforce the law. Why are you breaking the law? So something to think about. All right. Thank you for that. Um, and now, that was Lori. Okay, we have another one here. Uh, Derek Jang. Derek. Thank you, Derek. Um, Derek's question is do you share databases, Sheriff, with Torrance PD and uh, Palos Verdes Estates? If not, would it help to have access to that information? Uh, what type of database are you referring to? Uh, Actually, we do share information. There's a lot of different databases that are available. For example, when there's uh, warrants, warrants are in the system, they're shared by every agency that has access to the statewide system and the county has a county warrant information system whiz and so if someone stops someone say in LA County from a warrant that happened in, in Torrance, Torrance PD enters a warrant into the system and we come across individual and we stop them, hey that's a Torrance warrant, we can make the rest and book them in our jail and eventually winds up in Torrance court. So we are sharing that information all the time and when there's uh, issues we're investigating crimes that happen across different jurisdictions our personnel will contact Torrance PD, for example, or they may approach us, hey, we have a series of robberies or burglaries or uh, maybe a, a sexual predator of some sort, and we share that information. So that is ongoing all the time. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> we could use a little bit more uh, resources because we are the, the most understaffed law enforcement agency <coughs> in the nation. Well, you mean community, right? So just saying, as a community, how can you help? I think he's talking more like, what can community members do? Cheryl? What community members could do is we need the resources, one, to provide services to our at-risk youth. We have our youth activity leagues. We have the youth foundation that is always we're doing fundraising to support the youth athletic leagues. We have boxing clubs. We have different, uh, the YL centers. We have six of them throughout the county and they host kids for after school care. We have um, computer labs, we have different athletic events, we have the Explore program, we have in different cultural uh, clubs that the kids participate in these activities at the youth centers. We have volunteers that provide their time to mentor the youth. Uh, we have boxers, actually professional boxers, deputies who are boxers that train the kids in the boxing club, for example, at Century, that was in the news the other day. So we have a lot of these activities. So anybody has some type of expertise or the time that they can provide, by all means, we'd like to, to hear about it. Oh, you're getting greedy with the follow-ups. All right, go for it. Do you have a, a website or some place where you can let the community know if you need to We do have a website. We're going to have something up that can provide a, a place to deposit that, or to volunteer to sign up. The information is there, but not the sign-up feature. I think we're going to have to add that. That's a very good recommendation on your part. And, but so. I will add, we're here tonight. So if you want to leave your email, I, I don't think I have you here. Oh, I think I do. Um, I'm going to note this down for our team, so that way we can reach out. And if there's something, you know, let us know. That's for everyone here. So thank you for that. Appreciate that follow-up. Uh, Joe McGrath, where's Joe? Joe, you did not want to write your question, did you? You're like, I have a prepared statement related to cooperation with other law enforcement agencies. So what is your question, sir? Okay, so in the last week, the Seattle office of ICE released a press release, and the deputy uh, director of that office, Brian Wilcox, said they have seven cases in which ICE requested detainers like criminal and illegal aliens, excuse me, being held in local jails in the request for its norm. Why is it that we have that same problem here if the objective is I'm not talking about non-criminals, but people who committed heinous crimes, they detailed the specifics of those crimes that these people committed. 
if they committed a heinous crime and they're in our custody, that means they qualify for transfer to ICE according to SB 54. And we do actually do those transfers to the custody of ICE. What we don't transfer are the ones that are non-felony, non-serious crime. And what we're doing is a, is a balancing act. Because if we go hand in hand, we work with ICE in conjunction with ICE and we assist them in doing their job, we're per perceived by the undocumented population in LA as an extension of ICE. That has very, very bad consequences for public safety because then these are the people that are not gonna report being victims of violent crime, witnessing violent crime, and it's not one or two, it's almost one million residents. And a change of 1% only in drop in just forcible rape is more than 350 predators out there who are not reported, who are roaming freely. And it's, it's, I say, it's a disingenuous to believe that they're only gonna prey on the undocumented. And other people will say, well, it's too bad they don't belong here anyway. Well, that's just not reality. The reality is they're here. My job is public safety. My not, job is not federal immigration enforcement. So I wanna encourage Congress from both parties, get their act together, figure out how to do comprehensive immigration reform, secure the border the right way, do all these things, and then we can resolve the issue of the entire 11 million plus that are undocumented in the entire nation. But LA County has the greatest concentration in the entire nation. So for us, it is a very, very grave concern when they are not reporting and participating in the criminal justice system. Raphael Wong. Well, okay, great. Oh, but you know what, I forgot oh, to mention sorry. one Please. thing. On the federal immigration ICE detainers, if they have a concern of someone who's in somebody's custody anywhere in the United States, they need to get an actual warrant, a judicial warrant signed by a magistrate, and they'll be upheld by any district, including the ones that are called sanctuary cities or states. They will be upheld. The ICE detainers themselves, they're administrative. They've been deemed unconstitutional again and again, and they cannot be used to hold someone beyond their, their normal stay in custody. Once their time expires, we cannot detain them based on an ICE detainer legally. Does that make sense, Joe? Are you able to follow that? Because it's very complex. Well, Absolutely, that's, yeah. that's what SB 54, it is striking that balance. It's not an easy, if I go yeah. too far one side, too far the other side, I get slammed both ways. The fact that I have people upset in both camps means I'm probably got the right balance. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good sign. Yeah. Uh, Rafael, here we are, right? Thank you. Uh, Dear Chief Villanueva, when are you going to enforce noise ordinance? We have neighbors playing loud music overnight and LASD or other law enforcement has not done hard enough to curb the behavior. I request you to impose fine and confiscate the equipments of the violators. That one's a tough one, because that is not as simple as it sounds. Because we... Uh, you know what, you have to enforce the rules. It's very loud in 12 a.m. And the sheriff department uh, LAPD, they are not doing anything. I told them to confiscate their equipment, but they, they are not doing anything. So can yeah. we digest that and break that down, how that works for the law? Here's, because you don't want to get countersued if you, you no, put somebody up, right? It, it works both ways. Right. So when we have a complaint of loud noise, we send a deputy there for the first time. And say it's midnight, and they ask for voluntary compliance, turn the noise down. And typically what happens, they'll turn the noise down while the deputy's there. As soon as the deputies leave, what do they do? They crank it back up again. So you get the That's second. I want you to arrest the buyer later. Okay, so now. The warning may not be enough. However, we cannot go onto private property and violate that First Amendment by arresting someone in their own home. We actually have to have more evidence than just that. If we have, say it's two in the morning, it's uh, Monday night, people go to work on Tuesday, and we see people in the street wearing uh, pajamas and stuff, and it, it shocks the conscience, it's so outrageous, we actually have to get a magistrate to sign a warrant to allow us to go into the property to seize the equipment. We can't just seize it on our own because then we get sued by the property owner. So there's a protocol we have to follow. It's a little cumbersome, but we have to stick to the protocol because otherwise you as a, as a homeowner are gonna be footing the bill for the lawsuit from that, from that other homeowner. 
when he sues the department for unlawful search and seizure. So it's a fine line. Yeah. We always want to seek voluntary compliance first. And if you're not happy with the result of that first deputy, call the station back, mm -hmm. ask the watch, to talk to the watch commander, find out what they're doing to abate the problem. Okay? Most of the time it works. And uh, we have a process. We have, in fact, uh, where's a, uh, where? Um, Commander, are you aware of the, we still have the form, the 415E form? Yeah, what we can do sometimes is we'll give them a 415 form, add it to them so you have a written uh, document that says, we're, if we come back, you as the homeowner are going to be charged oh. for the amount of deputies, resources, helicopters, whatever it takes. And if you don't pay that bill, we'll put it on your property tax bill. And that's one of the things. That usually gets their cooperation really quick. Yeah, so the 415, you need to write The that helicopter down. field alone runs into thousands of dollars. It gets people's attention real, real quick. So, but... Did you we, know that? Okay, so that's good. So there we go. We have got some really good information. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, Matt Daniel, where are you, Matt? Hello. Uh, Matt has a question. Uh, you didn't write it out, so it, it's on the Second Amendment and the CCW issuance, correct? I did kind of write it down, but... Um, that's all know, I have. sheriffs here in Lameda, they do a great job, but just the other side of Western, less than a mile from here, is LAPD's Harbor Division. Just in Harbor Division's area alone, not counting Torrance and the beach cities, there's been 18 homicides since the first of the year. There's been 27 home invasion robberies. There's been numerous assaults that I couldn't even come up with an accurate number about. Now, I know in the past, it's been impossible to get a concealed weapons permit in Los Angeles County. And I have two questions about that. One, the last estimate that I got was there's approximately 500 civilians, not law enforcement, judges, DAs, but there's about 500 civilians that have CCWs. And I want to know what makes them more special than me and my family's protection. And also the five counties that surround Los Angeles County um, issue them I don't want to say freely, but a little more, less of a hassle. So I just want to clarify for the public here, Sheriff. A CCW is to carry a concealed weapon. That means somebody who's not law enforcement has a gun and you can't see it and you don't know if they walk into a store. So they can give permits, but it's a really high standard for obvious reasons, right? Well, we actually, we, we uh, reduce the standard from impossible to a good cause. So all I'm asking for for an applicant for CCWs is give me a particularized re reason that's specific to you. Not generalized fear of crime, but specific to you. It could be your occupation. It could be the activity you're doing at what time of the day. You could be a victim of a violent crime. Say you have the stalker from hell on your case and they're out about, they're not in prison. All these things, any one of these things, and we're, we're applying them pretty generously. So we've changed the standard, but you have to apply for it, okay? And, um, and that's a good cause standard. There's other counties throughout, particularly rural counties, that say their, their standard is shall issue. But the shall issue in LA County with 10 million people all concentrated in a very dense place, I'm having a hard time with the people that shouldn't have. Um, and if I expand that amount, like you pointed out about how many shootings and killings are going on Harbor, Imagine if we just put more and more guns out there on the street. We're not, not necessarily going to make ourselves any better. We're washing guns as it, as it is throughout the United States. I think there's over 300 million uh, weapons in, in, uh, in the United States. And we also, in the industrialized world, we're the number one in terms of death by firearms, be it suicide or be it by at the hands of another. So um, as long as we have... Uh, low, uh, very quick response rate from our local sheriffs. You're free to arm yourself in your home. No one's going to deny you that. You're free to arm yourself in your place of business. No one is going to deny that. Those are all protected, like you said, by the Second Amendment. The issue is in public. That has already been decided by the Supreme Court again and again, and they've always fallen down that we do have the right to restrict the CCW process for in public places. Me being a citizen of the United States, 
state doesn't cause enough for me to apply for that. And, and the other thing is, I'm just going to give a, a for instance, not the sheriff's area, LAPD's area. My wife was in a minor, minor car accident in that harbor area. The person got out of the car, started assaulting my wife. Took about eight minutes for law enforcement to get there. So in that eight minutes, she was being assaulted with nobody being there. Law enforcement's more of a reactive department than a very, very proactive. They can't be everywhere at the same time. So that would have been an appropriate thing for my wife to be able to defend herself against somebody that had a knife yeah. trying to kill her. Well, it takes eight minutes for you guys to get on scene and protect her. She did have just cause prior to this incident. She had no justifiable cause. But we all have just cause. We all should be well, able to defend ourselves. The well, standard what, yeah. for Los Angeles County is going to remain good cause. And that's a standard that I think the overwhelming majority of residents of Los Angeles County are comfortable with. And uh, rural counties, it's a different equation. In fact, my equation for somebody that's way out in Lake Los Angeles is going to be different because I know the response time for us to get out there might be 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And Mayor Paris from up north is taking his own initiative and he's, gonna, he's thinking about um, issuing CCWs through the city because the county won't do it. And I believe he's in a very rural area. Well, the city of Lancaster is not as rural as it used to be, but the outskirts of Lancaster are extremely rural. And uh, there's a very specific uh, role, and actually it's the chiefs of police and the sheriff. The, the cities, the mayors don't issue CCWs. So that's not part of their authority. But I will say, we hear your fear, and I can understand. I'm a woman. I've on TV, I've had stalkers, I get oh, it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I get it. But it, it's unfortunate that we all also don't want people out there running around with guns and God forbid they pull it out in self-defense and they shoot somebody else, right? And so that's you have all these scenarios. No, absolutely, but that's a whole other dialogue. We can be here for days, but absolutely. So thank you anyway for the question, and I'm sorry that happened to your wife. Um, no, I don't have one, no. Um, but I should get one, shouldn't I, especially after you uh, saying that to me. Um, thanks a lot, Now I got the fear of God. He gets a detail, not me, okay? So um, I want to, nobody, they didn't give their name here, but uh, no concerns, just interested in your background, sir. Thank you. Your background, so perhaps you can share that you are um, half Puerto Rican, half uh, Polish, Catholic. There's not too many Polish Puerto Ricans around. <laughs> I'm, I'm, one, I'm one of the few. Who's Polish? <laughs> there we go. Who's Puerto Rican? Eso, ah, Boricua. Okay. Y habla español también, el sheriff. ¿Quién habla español aquí? Muy bien. Muy bien, muy bien. Okay. Uh, born in Chicago, raised in upstate New York, Rochester, and then the island of Puerto Rico. I spent my... My youth there at the age of 20, I enlisted in the Air Force, wound up at Norton Air Force Base. And from there, I uh, went to Cal Poly Pomona, then wound up in the Sheriff's Department in 1986. And uh, I worked there for 32 years, retired in uh, 2018. I was already campaigning for the office of sheriff. Where'd you go to school? And I went to, ooh, I was all over. I started at University of Puerto Rico, then uh, Cal Poly Pomona, in uh, State University in New York. I got a bachelor's degree in liberal studies. Then I went to Cal State Northridge, got a master's in public administration. And then I went to the University of Laverne, I got a doctorate in public administration. So I kind of- PhD. I'm a little jealous, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> that is very impressive. And we should also share that you um, have a beautiful wife who is also in law enforcement. Yes, my wife, uh, Vivian, she just retired from the Sheriff's Department after 24 years. I met her at East Los Angeles Station when she was uh, an intern. She was at Cal State LA pursuing her bachelor's in criminal justice. So she was interning at East LA, and that's where we met. And you have a, a very handsome son? I have a son who uh, just started in the academy. And uh, he's a veteran of the Army, spent some years in Iraq <coughs> at the heat of the mess, and a mm. uh, small business owner, but he decided to shift careers. So and your he, grandfather? And I have two granddaughters, uh, 11 and 12 years old, and they're a handful. <laughs> I, tell my, my, I tell my son that they're punishment for him because he had so many girlfriends when he was young. Now he has to go switch from offense to defense. So good luck with that. 
I, and Sheriff sure, Rosita, okay, I, I'm really pushing you out of your comfort zone right now because that's what I love to do. That's just my, my thing. But he's not sitting on a stool because he's lazy. Let's be real. Um, you do have, because of all your work, um, a knee injury. Yeah, I kind of wore on my right knee running. I was a drill instructor at the academy, so I, I used to run the recruits around and scare them to death. But my knee blew out at one point, so the last 20 years I've been hobbling on one knee. Oh, yeah. Aguadilla. Ponce. Ah, los Leones de Ponce. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Los Tiburones de Aguadilla. Oh, wow. There you go. And uh, what sign are you? Just kidding. That's just my sign. I love that question. I ask it all the time. I'm terrible. I know. Sorry. All right. Let's go on with the questions from here now. Uh, we have more. We have uh, M. Millie Yamada. Is that right? Hello, Millie. Uh, could, do you want me to read this, or do you want to just say it? Okay. Is a good question. You, one, you can call animal control, and two, actually, even before you call animal control, <laughs> make sure if you have those little Fifi dogs, make sure you put them little away ones. in the house. Because yeah. uh, in some parts of the country, they're known as coyote bait, because that's all they do is they eat them. Do not yeah. leave your vulnerable pets. And if you have a pet door for these itty bitty ones, the coyotes will go in them. We've had actually coyotes in the houses attacking pets. So they are extremely, they're aggressive, they're smart, they hunt in packs, and they will flank you. I've, I live on the edge of wilderness on the east side of the San Gabriel Valley, and I've walked my dog who weighs 100 pounds, and I've been followed by a coyote, and I look on both sides of me at about 50 yards following me, are coyotes flanking, just looking for an opportunity to, uh, to attack. So they're, they're, they're bold, so you gotta be on, on your guard. Oh yeah, seven foot is not much. Get inside your house quick. <laughs> you might miss, that's my issue. <laughs> and then my colleagues in, are out there doing the story about in, you. <laughs> in an urban setting, I definitely you don't want to fire a weapon because you don't know where the rounds are going to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, if uh, it's between you and something right there in your property, by all means, use a weapon to defend yourself if you need to, but be cognizant cognizant that you're not going sideways because that round is going to continue, okay. particularly if you miss. Yeah. If you're shooting downwards into the ground, better odds. But uh, just be careful, okay? And I'm going to read your question. Okay, so I'm going to, because you have two here, so let me go uh, by the first one first uh, here, Sheriff. She says, crime, fatality in Powell's Ferdy's Mall parking lot. Um, that's A. Then B, you wrote gunshot at PCH Western. Recent fatality near Vermont, PCH. These are too close to home. So for those specifics, maybe Captain, would you like to refer to the Captain on the PCH one? The, uh, on the Sally Leeds one, that's Rolling Hills Estate, that murder is still... Susan, Susan, Susan that's right, thank Susan you. Susan Leeds. It's still not solved. We're working on it hard. They're, they're burning the midnight oil right now, yeah. going through all the leads. Uh, interviewing witnesses, uh, they have evidence to go through, and they're hoping for a break on the case. And uh, so we'll keep our fingers crossed on that one. But that's an active investigation that we're definitely, it, it's not uh, sitting in a dustbin somewhere. We're working hard to bring those responsible to justice. And on the specifics of the local one. Yeah. Uh, gunshot at PCH Western, recent fatality near Vermont, PCH. That was a drive-by that occurred in LAPD's jurisdiction, so that means that they would not have the information. Is that right? Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Let's go to Paul McKendry. Paul McKendry. Paul McKendry. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Hi, Paul. So, Paul, does LASD and Sheriff 
assist the federal government, ICE, in enforcing federal law. So we talked about it earlier, but I want to make sure you're heard. For example, deporting criminals that are illegal aliens. So it goes back to what you talked about earlier. What? They're closing. <laughs> Hurry. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> okay. We're going <laughs> to. And I'm going to actually, let me, let me add that to Raul Rodriguez, Jr., your question, why do you refuse to work with ICE? Since those are um, similar and also Greg Allen. Greg, right? No? Greg? Greg You're Greg, sorry. I was, I was, ICE, uh-huh. Give us an oath of safety and still take ICE out of the jail and allowing criminals on our streets to be good and Okay. How is that making us more safe? Okay. So just so you know, your question is assuming that that is happening. So we need to dissect that. The way people ask questions, it's like lawyers that are very leading in certain of their questions. So now let's talk about the facts. So I think that's really important here. So he, his question to you, Sheriff, is assuming that you are allowing convicted, I mean, you know, criminals are serious offenses. They raped someone, they killed someone, and you are not cooperating with ICE under SB 54 by allowing them out to the street. Is that happening, number one? No, that is not happening. Why we, is that, and how is that not happening? We are actually honoring SB 54. So all dangerous felons who qualify under SB 54, they are being transferred to the custody of ICE. That has been happening in spite of all the hoopla you hear in, the, in, the, in certain sections of the media. That is not true. So what we're doing is we're doing a very careful balancing act. And some people think, well, if you let the misdemeanor uh, convictions uh, go free into the community, that's a threat to everyone's safety. The bigger threat is convincing a one million undocumented residents they cannot participate in the criminal justice system by reporting being victims of a crime. When they do not report being victims of the crime, we are all less safe because of that. So that we're striking a careful balance. The worst of the worst that we know is a calculable risk. I don't want to take that risk with your safety. We're transferring them to the custody of ICE. Those are not that calculable a risk. I'm rolling the dice and we're going to let them go back into their communities where they came from. Remember, they've already served a sentence. It's not like they somehow escaped justice. They already serve their sentence. So this is that delicate balancing act between the two competing needs. Can I have a follow-up, please? If you're worried about undocumented feeling like they need to report more crimes mm -hmm. and that that's what's going on, then why are you not taking the goal? How do you measure and acquire that goal? What measurement of that goal do you attain? Or is that just a subjective goal so you can continue allowing uh, undocumented criminals on our streets? So Go ahead, sir. There's nothing subjective about this goal. In fact, it's also known as a Trump effect. When uh, President Trump uh, started using immigration enforcement as a political tool, there was very specific measurable indices that we could track. For example, forcible rape is one of the most underreported crimes. Social stigma, personal um, shame, all these things that factor in it. It's a very difficult crime to, to measure. However, people do step forward and report the crime. So it's the most easily susceptible to being swayed by some, some pressure. And throughout LA County in 2017, I believe is the last year that I have the records, and that was the first year that Trump was in office, we had a 12% increase in forcible rape throughout the entire county. However, the three cities that had the highest percentage of undocumented residents, or the three stations, patrol station area, and that was East LA Station, Century Station, and Pico Rivera Station, they reported an 8% drop in forcible rape. And that's statistically impossible given the 12% increase countywide. So that is what is known as a Trump effect. So people who were undocumented were afraid to step forward and report being victim of a violent crime. And that is measurable, and that is done study after study nationwide. And these are not things that are, you can refute. It's the hard evidence is already there. So this is not subjective. I mean, just let me give you an example, because I get, this is something we covered time and time again, Greg, on, on stories. And I, no, no, but, but hear me out. I'm going to speak to you as, the, as you know, director of communications. 
I understand that, and you can live with that lie all day long. What I want you to hear, though, because this is important, right? You know, when I would go out and cover stories, out of selfish public, you know, your own selfish interest, if, so, if tomorrow your housekeeper, who let's say was undocumented, saw somebody murder your neighbor who is in that area, maybe that, that housekeeper could go, I know you don't, but you need to fin let me finish and be respectful, because I, I allowed you to do a follow-up, sir. Thank you. So then you would want that person to be able to tell the deputy, I saw the guy. He looked like this. Because what if that person was able to go around loose, and the next victim is somebody in your family member? That, that's where we live in. We live, I mean, I understand that, whether that you don't like undocumented people and you think they're less than you, that is a personal feeling. But what you have to understand is that we're, let me finish, please. You need to let me finish. So what we're talking about is public safety here. No, I'm not, sir, but you'll have to let me finish tell you that. Okay, so I'm giving you an example so that you understand that. So we will move on. Thank you so much. Um, what, okay, let, you know, he hasn't said it, because you've been at our other ones. Go ahead, sir. Raul, well, right? Okay. Uh -huh. I was assaulted. I'm sorry to hear that. By an individual at the Kamala Harris event. I was holding up a sign and it was taken from me by that individual. I went over to reclaim my sign and he took a swing at me and hit me because I moved, he hit me in my chest. The officer that took the report took my license, got my name, phone number, address, and everything. I asked him to make a citizen's arrest that individual. He says, let's go outside and we'll all do that. I walked outside. John was with me. He was also taken out because he was also assaulted. Now, the, the, what I'm trying to say is that the, the officer never got the individual arrested. He never got the information from him. And What agency was this? Yours. Where? What city? What city? It was in LA. Southwest College, L.A. You guys were there. The, the sheriffs were there. Now the point I'm making though is that you talk about safety. Well, my my safety was not taken care of by the police officers at that at that. Um, the deputies. The deputies. So the point I'm making is I haven't heard from anybody. I did get a call finally from uh, uh, Officer Dupree from the Southwest College Division. That was about maybe two or three weeks ago. He was supposed to have called me back, and I haven't heard from him yet. So the point I'm making, sir, is that I need to hear from somebody before I take further action. Because I, I, I got it documented through my doctor. I had a sore uh, on my chest, black and blue mark. It was uh, painful. The point I'm making is that if, if someone doesn't contact me, I'm going to give you one week to contact me. Otherwise, I'm going to take further action. Thank you for your comment. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, I know you were waiting patiently. I do want to get through these, but is it a quick remark? Real quick. Okay, sir. The Los Angeles Times this morning has a derogatory headline uh, titled Bait and Switch, which uh, referenced the fact, according to the newspaper, that uh, sworn officers from ICE were being replaced by contract people to come deal with these issues as people's uh, term is served. Has that any effect on the efficiency of your office? Because the newspaper article inferred that it was given the headline, bait and switch. Well, I think the actual article is a bait and switch, <laughs> not the content of it. That because, yeah, no, I've, uh, the Times has a strange obsession with my office and what I do, but throughout the entire campaign, which they didn't care to cover because I couldn't win, <laughs> I explained in detail the fact that I was going to remove ICE stations from the county jail. I explained in detail that we have a, a third-party contractor that actually transports all federal detainees, be it FBI, Secret Service, DEA, ATF, ICE, DHS, all of them. They use one company to do transportation. We have custody assistants who actually vet the requests that come from ICE to see if the person qualifies under SB 54. We have to do that no matter what, because that is our obligation under SB 54. So what the Times did is a bait and switch and pretended that we somehow didn't do that, we just started doing that under me. Actually, that's what we have to do all along since SB 54 started. We have to screen them to make sure we're not sending people to ISIS custody who are one, U.S. citizens, heaven forbid, 
or two, legal residents that are not eligible or undocumented who are not eligible under SB 54. Because ICE does a shotgun approach. They want everybody detained, and we're not going to honor that. So we have to screen and make sure only the ones that qualify who pose a threat, okay. They qualify, then they get transferred through the third party. So I explained this in detail. So there was no really bait and switch. The fact that the Times put one person's opinion as their title, that's kind of dishonest journalism. Exactly. I, I agree. So. All right. Thank you, sir. Sylvia Macia. Sylvia Macia. There you are. Masia. I'm sorry. You're right. Let's see that. Acento en la. ¿Dónde son vos? Cubana. Cubana. Yeah. Bueno. Caribeña. All good. Listen, until you're Native American, don't get me started. Number one, what are the numbers on response times for crimes at Lamita Station in RPV, Rancho Palos Verdes area? Um, is the trend getting better, shorten or not? Um, the second question, Sheriff, is we, Rancho Palos Verdes, has had several daytime home invasions with owners home in uh, Ladera Linda most recently. Is that right? Uh, what are we doing to mitigate? Good question. I'm going to refer to uh, Captain, Powers? Captain Powers and Lieutenant White on the response times. I know it's always more of a challenge when you go to go areas that are hilly and they're far away. It's not easy because you just can't really go very fast. Yeah, so that's yeah. a challenge. My community, we have the same problem. And then they closed Hacienda Boulevard, which made the matter even worse. So I, I sympathize with that. I've been told that we are under the threshold. I don't have those numbers to, to, to give you stats or, or anything like that, but Lieutenant White has... has we, we respond to all of our times below the, the required thresh, threshold, but where some people think we are late is because all of our car, our crimes our calls for service are prioritized which means you may call for a loud noise your neighbor's music is too loud that call goes to our dispatch center and it's sent out to the field to one of our patrol cars but that patrol car may be handling a they may be on a report call at that time right then once they complete that report call they could be en route to your call and they get a a rescue call, someone's having a heart attack. That means that your call, once again, goes on, on hold. Sure. So a lot of folks think, well, it took you an hour to get here. Well, that particular car may have caught two priority calls en route to your call, and they had to put it on hold. What we sometimes can do a better job is when you make a call for service and we're going to be delayed, we should tell you, that we're going to be delayed because our units are tied up. They could be tied up on a burglary in progress call or a burglary, a burglary just occurred call when we have units on a containment looking for a bad guy. That could take an hour. It could take an hour and a half. If we have a helicopter above or a dog, your call or the other calls have to wait. And as soon as we can free up units to handle those calls, we'll do that. But occasionally, it takes us a long time to get to low priority calls. For instance, a loud noise, a, uh, the, the stuff that would be a priority would be a domestic violence call. Hey, my neighbors are fighting again, and I need you to get here now because I think someone's going to be assaulted. Or you come home and you see your neighbor's house is being burglarized and you call us. We're stopping what we're doing and responding to those calls immediately. But the stuff that's low priority uh, may take a minute for us to get there. I'm just wondering, are you tracking? Is it going up, down, same, same? We, we have two special officers that we contract for, and we have 44,000 people in your area for the station, I think it's 74,000. When you say special officers, RPD pays an additional amount to the sheriff for two dedicated officers. Well, I, I thought it. Okay, Eight uh, hours, twice a week. But, but understand, dedicated means that those, those deputies still may be deployed where they're needed. Right. If there's a priority situation that needs to be handled in, and the handling deputy needs additional resources, they'll ask for what we call backup or additional units, and those units move from this area over to here. And then once that is settled, they start handling the routine calls. And it, still, there may be a response time there. For instance, if we have something that happens in the Miralest area, 
sir, I, I understand. Okay. It's, it's a competing resource issue. Yes. All my question was is, are you tracking it or are we getting we, better? We, we, track, we track response Obviously, time. Obviously, violent items, burglaries, that needs to go first. That's why I the, the whole the whole division tracks response times, and every station tracks response times. And I want to say the standard for an emergency call is seven minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Priority is twenty. Twenty. And then routine is sixty minutes. Correct. Like report call, so ten, twenty, and sixty <clears throat> is the standard. But remember, I talked about being the most understaffed agency. It puts us. That's. Yeah. She was trying to help, but his question was, "What do you need?" So we need to talk to our cities. And Well, we're working right now. We, I inherited a, a department that was dying, that was shrinking. We have 958 vacancies. Now we dropped it down to 921. So we've actually improved by 40. We're on pace to get back to zero in December of 2020, which is going to improve the response time because that means there's no vacancies anywhere. Every, every station is fully staffed. So that's our best model under the current budgeting plan. If we want to go higher, because we're still understaffed overall in comparison to other uh, cities, other counties, and other states, well, then it comes about how much pain are we willing to endure in terms of taxation, stuff like that. And that's a, that's a political decision. That's a conversation we need to have, you as a resident, with the cities, with the Board of Supervisors, because it's not a simple, simple question and answer. It's the big picture, how far do we want to go? Right now, we're making things happen with the very few resources we do have. The deputies are dedicated. They're excited coming to work finally. So that actually pays off for every resident because now you see the deputies out there. They got a smile and they're, they're happy. And uh, that goes a long way towards resolving some of this. <clears throat> yeah. Sir, I, I wanted to answer your question when you asked earlier. But the, the biggest thing that, that, that you folks can do here to help us is to get involved in your in your own neighborhood. Neighborhood watch is uh, not where it should be around here. Our biggest challenge around here outside of violent crime is residential burglaries. And we have people that live in these neighborhoods that have lived in their neighborhoods for 20 years and they don't know their neighbors. Mm -hmm. They don't have a, you've been in a neighborhood for 20 years and you don't have a key to your neighbor's house, something's wrong. You go out of town, and you won't tell your neighbors you're going out of town, but you'll post it on social media, the beautiful <laughs> pictures. So if I'm story. a bad guy, and I'm monitoring social media, and I happen to know where you live just because of some of the other pictures you post, I know you're out of town. And we, that lady right there is the queen of Neighborhood Watch, Gail Lorenzen. <laughs> If, 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 if we could get some other neighborhoods to do what she does, all of these areas would be safer. Residential burglaries are our most serious property crime that we have around here. And with, with drugs being what they are, it's not going to go away. Drug, drug, drug users break in houses to steal, to supply their habit. They break in cars. The other one is... Everybody in here probably has, everyone in here probably has a car. We tell you time and time again, please stop le leaving the stuff that if I was a crook, I'm going to steal. If I can see your laptop, I'm going to bust the window and take it. If I can see your cell phone or your digital camera, and we, I can't tell you how many times I've told people they should lock their cars and they look at me like, but that's why I moved to this nice neighborhood, so we don't have to lock our stuff. And the question is, if you're a crook, where would you go to steal? From the haves or the have-nots? Generally speaking, you are all of the haves, and you make it easy for crooks to rip you off. So, neighborhood watch, or if you want to help, get involved in your neighborhood, learn all your neighbors' names and their habits, and if you're going to go out of town, tell your neighbors so they can park their car in your driveway, make your house look lived in. Your neighbors should have a key to your house. If they don't, some of us aren't living right because you should know your, your neighbors. So, that's it. I've had this conversation with Lost Hills, with Malibu, 
all these different communities are all tend to be affluent. It's the exact same same equation, the same narrative. And like you said, when you know that your neighbors are away on that wonderful European vacation, you know the one that's three three weeks. If you see the U-Haul parked in the driveway, wait a minute, they weren't moving out at the same time, so something's wrong. That phone call does wonders. That, that's a fact. We, we've had burglaries where neighbors watched. And because they didn't want to get involved, they didn't call. And they knew something was wrong. And then they look at us like we're supposed to show up because we're the crime stoppers and figure out, with no clues, who did this crime. Uh, and going back to answer your question, without the specific numbers, we get to the majority of our calls below the threshold. Year, no, year in and year out. Uh, my name is Jim Wallach. I'm the uh, commander responsible for Lameda Station. And uh, the response time to something that is, is brought up at every town hall meeting, because it's very important, how fast our deputies get out there. And it's something that we track on a weekly basis. Our chief was... Uh, tech savvy enough to uh, bring up the numbers off our internal uh, uh, our internal uh, website. So uh, the sheriff talked about routine calls. Routine calls are calls for service. You, you walk outside, your, your vehicle's been broken into overnight. Uh, that would be a routine or report call. The industry standard is 60 minutes. In the city of Lomita, uh, we do it in 23 and a half minutes. We arrive. Uh, for a priority call. A priority call is a crime that, that maybe just occurred. Uh, you witness something, the bad guys have now gone, uh, we're able maybe to set up a containment or something like that. That would be, we need to get there really fast. Uh, the standard is 20 minutes, we're getting there in uh, 6 minutes and 15 seconds. Okay? Uh, emergency calls, those would be a medical emergency, <laughs> Somebody's actually breaking into your house at that time. Uh, the bad guy is still at the scene. The industry standard is 10 minutes. In the city of industry, or excuse me, the city of Lomita, we get there in three minutes and 30 seconds. So Lomita is doing fantastic. <laughs> and really, that, that, is, that is a testament to your city council. They, they put their money where their mouth is. They pay for the resources. They pay for the deputies. And as a result, we're able to get these uh, outstanding times. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I just had a question. So those numbers were for the city of Lomita. City of Lomita. I have, I have them all here, though. Excuse me? Uh, not the Lomita Station's whole area? Or? Uh, we, have the, we, have the, uh, we have the number. Excuse me. We have them for every city. Every city, we do them individually. Okay. And I have those numbers for it, if you like. But right. I will tell you that every single one of them. And so, part of it is... It, you know, we have stations, uh, Lancaster, uh, Palmdale, where things are really spread out. They, they, they have a lot of deputies up there. Uh, they do a great job. But I will tell you that their response times are, are longer. But here in the urban area, uh, suburb, suburban area, uh, ours are a lot faster. But yours, I will tell you, are unbelievable, to be honest with you. They're really off the charts. And I'll be happy to go over them with you if you want to see me afterwards. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I will tell you that for law enforcement, our busiest night used to be New Year's Eve, and now by far it's the 4th of July. We get more calls for service in the 4th of July, and every single station 
has to come up in op with an operations plan that is uh, personally viewed and reviewed by our, by our chief uh, to make sure that we have the proper resources. But even with those, the calls for service are, are overwhelming. Now, if you called in and you saw somebody actually shooting a gun, unless it was misunderstood by one of our dispatchers, uh, I promise you that would be what we would call an emergent call, and we'd be out there quickly. Well, I will tell you, if, if that is what's happened uh, in the past, I will promise you it will not happen this year. Even if it means that, well, I will tell you one thing, that the deputy will speak to you before the end of the evening. And if we have to stake a deputy out there, because it happens every year, we will do that for you. I what promise. What taking a video of it? Say something happens and this doesn't happen. What if, what if we took a video of it with our phones of the person doing it? And then we call you, when you get there, are you guys going to do something about that? Or how does that 100 percent. 100 percent. Not only would we, would we do something immediately, but our, we would take a report and our investigators would follow up on it. But if the person is available and they, they're shooting a gun indiscriminately, they will be arrested. They come out on their balcony with it. Wow. Great. Great. Well, please, I, I, I will ensure that a Lameda deputy speaks with you before the end of the evening. And we'll get the details of it. And I will promise you that will not happen this year. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Shafat has a question, and it's uh, so maybe stand by here. It still has to do with burglaries. Um, Shafat from Rolling Hills Estates. Between November 2018 and March 2019, uh, Shafat, by the way, where are you? Oh, there you are. Thank you, sir. Um, there were six burglaries, yeah? And you said in a specific neighborhood. So, what are you doing to make us feel safe at home? Also, were the burglars caught? Do we know which ones? Or you can speak with that if you don't mind. You'd be talking about the vantage point. Yes. Uh, development, correct? Yes. Gated community over off of yes. Crest Road? Yes. Uh, I believe your burglaries have dropped significantly, correct? Um, keeping my fingers crossed, yes. Yeah, what we... There's a Chilean burglary crew, was in the LA Times, they reported on in some other newspapers. Uh, there's a group of burglars, professional burglars, that would fly in from Chile... I can talk though, right, sir? Thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. There's a Chilean burglary crew, and several of them were arrested out in like Thousand Oaks, and the sheriff's department, Ventura County, recovered a, a slew of evidence of uh, recovered property, and and their their M.O. was to target uh, affluent communities and enter off of the trails when folks were away at dinner around dusk. And they were taken into custody and they believed that there were dozens of these people in the country and that they would fly in, um, do their crimes, and leave. They would, they would take jewelry, cash, high-end purses, and they would take that loot and leave the country. Uh, that crime is, those crimes are still being investi investigated. It, it was so large that the FBI is involved as well. But we believe, based on the, the MO, that this Chilean burglary crew was involved in that. They also targeted jewelry stores as well. Thank you. So we're, so we're coming up against the uh, clock here. So we got a, um, a question here that I wanted Captain Powers to address about wildfires. Uh, and the question is from Bonnie. Bonnie? Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, would the Sheriff's Department control traffic to evacuate RPV Ranchos Palos Verdes if there is a wildfire? And that answer is yes. And uh, just recently I attended a, a council meeting uh, where the, uh, a, a battalion chief from the LA County Fire Department was there and present, and we were actually discussing the, these processes. And so by all means, there's a, a working relationship between LA County Fire, LA County Sheriff, and the neighboring law enforcement agencies. And so uh, when you have a situation like that, yes, we'll definitely uh, participate in that, and we'll uh, close roads, conduct evacuations if necessary. But yes, there is a working relationship, and yes, we will be a part of that. Excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry, but I have to ask you about the uh, deportation sweeps this weekend. You virtue singled, singled on, um, twi on Twitter that you were not going to assist ICE or Homeland Security, but yet you have 140 people with deportation orders signed by a judge. Who are you serving by not assisting to deport them? People with deportation orders signed by a judge. 
Okay, uh, John, thank you for that question. Maybe we can do is we can have that him uh, give you something in writing, but we, we want to honor Town Hall, you know, the community here and their questions. And we are up against the clock, so I don't want to get yelled at by the residents that they didn't get their questions answered. Um, so let me just get to Larry. Uh, Larry, how, how are you handling the, Larry, where are you? Thank you. Right thank you. How are you handling the mixed morale amongst the deputies? The morale ranges from some deputies are happy and others have concerns about the direction of the department. Sure. Well, uh, from what I'm gathering from the deputies on the street, they're excited, they're happy. We, uh, we, we switched from being a petty, vindictive employer who was unstable to one where we were reliable. The decisions we're making are sustainable based on evidence, not agendas. And that protects both the taxpayer and the homeowner because now we can recruit successfully, we can retain people, and that provides for increased morale. And I think we have a lot of evidence of that now because we have 18,000 employees that are now recruiting actively, whereas before they were recruiting for other agencies. They were literally telling people that you don't want anywhere but our department. Now the tide is turning in our favor. Now that's why our classes are running full. We added a total of 12 classes now for 2019, another 12 in 2020. That's why we're on target for December 2020 to get our full staffing model up. And all of that is a reflection of morale. So we're averaging 65 uh, applications a day. In a couple of weeks ago, we actually hired 22 people in one day. So it, it's happening at the pace we need it to happen so we can better serve the needs of, of your community. Thank so, you. Uh, Sandy Berens, Sandy, thank you. Is paper, pepper spray a good defense when walking? That's a great question. It's a very good defense, but there's nothing beats awareness. You got to be aware of your surroundings. Too many victims of violent crime, they got the cell phone thing going, they got the, the earbuds, whatever, and they're totally distracted, and there's the predator walking behind them for the last whatever un unnaturally close or matching their pace. No, those are telltale signs. Same thing when you go to the ATM. Don't go to the ATM at 10 o'clock at night in a desolate area. It's an open invitation to be robbed. And pay attention. If you see some young man lurking around an ATM, don't go there. And gassing up late, too. I see that a lot. Same thing, yes. Yeah. Do you want to do a quick follow-up? Related question, coyotes. Oh, coyotes? With pepper spray. Oh, pepper spray. Oh, Actually, it, it does work. <laughs> Because I've tried uh, pepper spray on pit bulls. It does have a very interesting effect. They don't like it. They tend to go the other direction, so. I still vote for run and get into a closed environment. <laughs> but <laughs> if you run with it in your possession, that's fine. Which one? Those coyotes, yeah. Oh, the air horn. Yeah, yeah, the little, the little it's like a little. Just don't deploy it upwind. Horn. Don't recommend it. That's right. And uh, for the last question of the evening, Gabriella Fisher. Gabriella, thank you for being here. Your question is, um, you're the founder of the Utopian Society Project. Um, is there anything we can do to help the Sheriff's Department, sir, programs that we can be a part of, et cetera? Utopian Society. I'm afraid to ask exactly <laughs> how is that, uh, how does that work? Fantastic. That that is definitely a positive. It's a plus. And a lot of the times, the job we do, unlike the fire department, God bless the fire department, <laughs> but they could do fifty thousand dollars worth of water damage to put out a five hundred dollar fire, and they host a parade for them. <laughs> we are always in conflict no matter what we do. Exactly. Someone is not going to be happy with what we do every That's day right. of the week. So I love our fire. The funny thing about between the fire and law enforcement, we run in opposite directions depending on what it is. They got the turnout gear going. They're on top of a roof in 110 degree heat, sawing away at a fire. And we're thinking they're out of their minds. Yet when the bullets are flying and we're running towards it, they look at us going, you're out of your minds. But we both work together real well. And it's, yeah, we, we need them. They need us. And we want to thank you for being here tonight. We're up against the clock. He actually has another appointment, but if you do it quick, I appreciate you. Can you guys explain to us, I mean, it's so important to everybody to know about the AB 47. I know this is making you guys' job a lot more difficult. Okay. So is, is there any way that you guys can explain really fast about how it works? Because I know there's burglarized that are under $1,000 and consider as misdemeanors. 
it um, actually there's three measures. There is AB 109, which is a prison realignment bill. Then there's Propositions 47 and Proposition 57. That has to do with supervised release. But Prop 47 had a lot of unintended consequences because one of the ways we got people into drug treatment was they were trying to avoid a felony conviction so they would agree to go to the drug treatment. And it was hard to get that, that bed space. Now they're running half empty because we, we lack the hammer to keep them in these facilities because it's a misdemeanor only. So there are several uh, legislative efforts underway to try to correct some of these unintended consequences. A lot of the measures were put in good faith with good intentions, but long term, we have to be honest with the impact of it and figure out, okay, is there something we need to change or tweak to make it work for everybody? And that process won't be solved overnight, unfortunately. But we'll still work with the laws that we have on the books and we just have to roll up our sleeves and just work a little harder. So I'm getting the look from behind, and I don't have a weapon, so I better obey. So thank you so much. The oh. sheriff does have some thank yous to, oh, yeah. uh, to share. we got to thank the city of Lomita, the mayor, your council, your staff for a wonderful job. Captain James Power, our new uh, station captain, a round of applause. <laughs> Lieutenant Michael White, where'd he go? Sergeant Roger Diggerlando. And Kirk Jackson on the video. Danielle Marone also on the video. And also Lieutenant Jeff Diedrich, where is he? He's in the back there. He's in charge of our homeless outreach services team for the entire county. He is our expert on homeless issues and it didn't come up tonight, but he is definitely our expert in anything that has to do with the homeless and what we're doing across the entire county to in impact that. So thank everyone for your attention. We appreciate it.